Good morning, party people, and welcome to Office Hours. This is the last day on my 10-day Panama Canal cruise, uh, and it's you can see a little stormy back behind me. That's where the sun's rising. Uh, light will probably change a few times during the recording. Uh, but uh, the captain warned us last night that there were going to be 35 knot winds today and a little bit of a slight sea, so... Uh, we may have a little bit of a rock and roll ride here later today, which I kind of enjoy. I don't usually get seasick, so I kind of enjoy it. So your top voted question comes from Clippy the DBA, who asks, Hi Brent, how do you keep up with technology in general and keep up to date with technology in general and in SQL Server specifically? So because I've been doing it for so long, I probably have a different answer than a lot of you would be able to do, which is as uh, community previews of new versions come out, I dig deeply into those for the parts of SQL Server that I care about. Um, so, but a lot of you may be just getting started with trying to keep up to date on whether it's SQL Server, Azure, SQL DB, Amazon Web Services, whatever. Here's my general advice for keeping up with technology set aside a certain amount of time each week that you're going to use to learn. Maybe it's when you first get started, it's four hours of self-training that you're gonna do reading, doing demos, reading blog posts, whatever, but set aside a certain amount of time, and maybe it's not gonna happen at the same time every week, you know, Monday from 8 a.m. to noon or whatever, um, but get that specific window, and then over time, you're gonna need to increase the size of it. Like for me, it's usually two days a week now. After, you're gonna start out smaller. You're gonna start out with like an hour or two each week, maybe going up to four hours each week. But keep track each week of whether or not you're actually meeting that objective. Because there'll be times in your life when you fall behind, when you have personal things that come up that you have to dedicate your time to. Uh, but just be aware that the more time that you go into the hole, like week after week, if you keep going into the hole, that's why you're not keeping up. You have to keep pushing yourself to drive that number higher rather than let it settle down lower. There's a whole separate question around uh, whether or not you use your own time for that or whether you use company time. And answers to that kind of depend on the work that you do. If you're a consultant, you probably have to use some company time for that. Uh, whereas if you're a full-time DBA for a company, not all DBA, not all companies see the value in having their sp staff spend time on training. We just expect you to magically know it. Next up, Bjork. <laughs> Bjork asks, should foreign keys be indexed from day one or only when performance issues arise? The way that I like to tell developers who are building a new application is I want you to put a clustered primary key on every table. Typically, that's on an identity column. Then put in foreign key relationships and index on those columns order ID, customer ID, item ID, put in indexes on those columns, and that's it, and nothing else. Over time, what you'll find is that you may have to change some of those indexing strategies or even some of those foreign key strategies, but the reason why it often helps to index on the foreign keys is that's usually what you're joining and filtering on. Show me all the orders for one customer ID, for example. Uh, next up we have, let's see here. Oh, Clippy the DBA had another highly voted one. Hola Brent, if you just started your consulting business, what things would you change or do differently based on your current consulting business experience? I don't, I don't have regrets in my life. Um, there, because everything that I look back on, I'm like, oh, that seemed like a mistake looking back, but it led me to the place where I am and I'm happy where I am. Having said that, when you're young, you learn lessons about yourself, not just about the industry, but about yourself as well. And one of the things that I learned about myself is that I don't like managing people. Um, I tried being a manager and a lead, going back all the way to when I was in the hotel business. I don't like managing people. And so uh, if I would have known that early on, I think that would have shaped my interest in building a consulting company that had lots of people in it. Um, 
it, going back to when uh, Jeremiah, Kendra, Tim, and I started the consulting company, I was like, I, I just want to be able to focus on the parts of the job that I love, the SQL Server parts, uh, the blogging and research parts, the training other people parts. I don't want to deal with the meetings and the uh, stupid politics. And I'm like, wait a minute, well, that's if you're going to grow a company and with a lot of consultants, there's going to be a lot of the meeting and politics parts. Uh, so I, I think if I would have known that, I would have wasted less time uh, trying to build a consulting company with multiple people. Having said that, if I hadn't gone down that road in my life, we wouldn't have SP Blitz. We wouldn't have SP Blitz Index and Blitz Cash, things that would only have come about had I been working together with a team of my peers uh, who shared common interests. Uh, otherwise, it just wouldn't have happened. Next up, uh, Hadar asks, what bad stuff can we look forward to once SQL Server hits the max size for a data file? Any interesting stories of this happening in the wild? It's never happened to me. Um, it's never happened to me. So that, that's, a, that's a tricky one. Because I want to say right now, it's up in the petabytes size. And usually people hit performance problems uh, with me at much smaller sizes than that. People come running in going, oh my god, I have this one terabyte or ten terabyte database and I can't get the thing to perform well. And we go from there. But it's, uh, I, I would be surprised if people at the multi-petabyte level are happy with performance uh, without having teams of people managing the database 24-7. And if you have teams of people doing that, you don't need somebody like me. Next up, Eduardo asks, how do I find the worst performing query for a given application using the first responder kit? Okay, application makes this tricky. If you have a lot of applications connecting to the same SQL server in the same database, I've got bad news. SQL Server doesn't differentiate between which applications are running a query. Now, it does when the queries are running live, because you can see that in things like SysDM exec requests, but it's not stored over time, which user or which application called a given query. Um, if you think about it, I always tell people that the same engine that works for you also has to work for shops like Stack Overflow that may run 50, 100,000 batch requests a second under load. You couldn't track that information in any kind of meaningful way without persisting it in some other platform, not the very database that you're querying. So if, it, if you really meant to say, I want to break it up by database, then SP Blitz Cache is the one that you want because you can break queries up by database. You can say, for example, uh, show me the top 10 queries doing the most CPU work in one given database. But as soon as you got multiple applications querying the same database, you're out of luck. Uh, so Okay, so I, and you did ask, though, the first responder kit. How do you do it if you can't do it with the first responder kit? Monitoring tools. Stuff like Quest Spotlight, idea a SQL DM. Uh, um, uh, I don't know if the other ones do it, uh, but I know Quest Spotlight has one of my, and Foglight has one of my favorite user interfaces for this, where it's almost like a business intelligence uh, UI where you can slice and dice by user, by application, by time of day, all kinds of cool stuff. Next up. Nathaniel says, is it safe to overlap invocations of the tools in the first responder kit? For example, run SP Blitz Index as the same time as SP Blitz Cache. Yes, different scripts are fine. The same script can cause problems. Um, they're supposed to be able to be called from different sessions, but I've seen instances uh, where if you call SP Blitz first multiple times across different uh, SSMS tabs, for example, uh, on the same server in the same database, uh, that you'll get errors from time to time. We try to clean, catch those out and clean them out whenever we catch them, uh, but just I would generally say don't monitor the server to death. Uh, if you need to call the same script, just kind of coordinate between teams and run it on a scheduled job rather than having everybody try to hammer SP Blitz first at the same time, for example. 
Next up, Alex says, regarding your last office hours, you talked about SQL Server 2022. I was planning to upgrade from 16 to 2022, and now you've got me thinking, should I upgrade to 19 instead? No, I, 2022, I, I said on a recent office hours, I don't think it was really ready when it shipped, but the, the parts that I'm talking about there are the parts that were new for SQL Server 2022. I don't think that those were ready, and they're still not ready. Um, as indicated by the fact that they're still in preview, and it's freaking almost April of 2023. Uh, so, so having said that, I, I would still upgrade to 2022 if you're the kind of shop that only upgrades every three or four versions. So you went 16, it is now the year 2023, so you kept the same version of SQL Server in place for seven years. That's a good thing. I like it. Good for you. But if you're going to keep the same version in place for seven years, I'd rather have you go to the latest version of SQL Server than go with something that's already four years old. Ha ha ha! Gopher asks, what criteria do you use when you're picking cruise ship line A versus B? Okay, so a long time ago I had to make those decisions. Now these days I mostly cruise on Princess because that's where I've got status on. Princess tends to have an older clientele. I'm usually one of the youngest people on the ship other than when grandparents bring their grandchildren kind of thing. Um, uh, but it, Princess tends to skew older so they have older types of activities. I don't do any kind any of the activities anyway. I don't do like the hairy chest competition or whatever. Couldn't win that one if I tried. Uh, I tend to just veg out on the deck and do excursions and go off on my own when the ship's in port. Um, the only things that I really use on the ship are the food uh, and I like nice, quiet, open decks and Princess has a lot of those. Um, and I don't want a bunch of kids yelling around and screaming when I'm on a cruise ship. Um, I've cruised with friends who have kids, that's totally fine, but I don't want whole teams of, you know, hundreds of them like you see on a Disney cruise or carnival or something like that, so that's why I chose Princess. Um, the other line that I like a lot is Celebrity. Celebrity has gorgeous art, has beautiful modern art. The ships are very beautiful, and they're, they tend towards a younger, affluent clientele. Um, there's a lot more interesting food and chef's table type experiences, uh, but uh, there you go. Uh, if you want an active lifestyle, Royal Caribbean and Norwegian tend to have a lot of things like rock climbing stuff. Uh, surf decks on board their ships uh, tend to be more young and active. Carnival is like the Walmart of cruising. It's really cheap. It's, uh, you know, tons of people just getting hammered all the time. Lots of screaming children. Disney is for pe families with kids and adults who like really interesting intellectual uh, entertainment because they do things like painting classes, uh, cooking classes. Uh, Disney also tends to be one of the more expensive cruise ships too as well. Princess is relatively affordable. And then last up for today, AG asks, I'm in a shop with backups that, that backup policies that do full backups daily. My colleagues say that there was a research informing that course of action. What is the best gentle approach to convince management to resort to full backups for weekends and then do differentials every night? I'm going to disagree with you. I wouldn't convince management of that. If you have the window to do full backups every night, then you should. I can't tell you how many times I have seen people try to get fancy with their backups and do just like fulls once a week, differentials every day, and then they had problems where they didn't have the full because somebody started deleting files that were older than three days. Restores take longer because you have to restore the full than the most recent differential, then you can start applying transaction logs. When you're under the gun to get a restore done quickly, no one cares that you save time every night doing backups faster every night if you can't by doing differentials who gives a rip they want to know that you can restore as quickly as possible and that's where fulls every night will ex will be so much better off than doing fulls once a week and then differentials so where does it make sense with differentials every night 
They caught on back in the days when we had one terabyte and above databases where you really did struggle to back them up the native way every night. A lot of people didn't have the appropriate performance uh, hardware in order to do full backups every night for that. Or, and the space was a killer too, but back before backup compression. Now, these days you can back up a one terabyte database and restore a one terabyte database fairly easily with modern solid state 10 gig ethernet. Where that becomes a problem today is in say five, 10 terabytes where it does become more challenging to back it up every night and the space is so big to uh, accommodate that. And instead you don't mess around with differentials, you do sna uh, sand snapshots. Sand snapshots are a much better way of dealing with multi-terabyte backups and restores. The backups and restores are nearly instantaneous. Uh, they don't involve shuffling large data across the network. It's all done at the storage layer. I am a huge, huge fan of storage snapshot backups. And I, I even tell clients, as soon as you approach the one terabyte mark, you should stop and think, do I want to change my backup strategy towards sand snapshot backups? Because it makes so much sense. All right, that's all the questions we're going to tackle today. I am going to go get a manicure, although I don't think that they're open yet. It's only uh, 821 on the cruise ship here. Uh, they actually, they are open now, come to think of it. I'm going to go do a manicure. I forgot to bring fingernail clippers, and I'm like anal retentive about the length of my fingernails. I know it probably doesn't look like they're long here on the video, but any time that I can feel them on the trackpad or on keyboards, I'm like, Arr! so I'll be uh, going and doing that today. Thanks for hanging out with me today, and I will see y'all on the next Office Hours. Adios.